Chapter One of Bill Bolton and the Hidden Danger by Noel Sainsbury. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter One Through the Window. Bang, bang, bang. Bill Bolton, startled from a sound sleep, sat up in bed. His room was pitch dark. For a moment or two, he listened to wind whistling through trees and the swishing pound of a heavy downpour. Lightning flashed in the bright flare of a summer electrical storm, and through open windows he saw rain and steel rods lashing the darker night. Crash! Bang! Bang! Thunder, that's all, said young Bolton, and lay down again. Crack! Bill was out of bed in a jiffy. He heard the unmistakable ping of a bullet as it struck the rain pipe by his farther window. Crash! Bang! This time he dropped to the floor and lay still. The second shot smashed a pane in the upper window sash and knocked over a copper water jar that stood on the mantel, sending it rattling to the floor. That lad, said Bill to himself, is perched in a maple. Wild shooting, too, even in the dark. I wonder what in blazes he's aiming at. He crept on all fours to the window and knelt before it, bringing his eyes level with the sill. Crash! Crack! Bill winced. With the thunderclap came a ball of red fire. It struck a large northern maple, shot down the trunk, and vanished into the turf below the spreading foliage. For an instant, trees, shrubbery, and lawn were illuminated with red light. Bill caught a glimpse of the flower garden beyond broad lawns and a group of figures standing on the drive near the stone wall that separated the Bolton estate from the highway. He plainly saw a man drop from the big maple to the ground. Then, as he sprang to his feet and leaned out of the window, the glare was gone, and black night shut down on the world again. "'Reach down and give me a hand, Bill,' the muffled voice came from just below. "'Who is it?' Bill spoke in the same cautious tone. "'It's me, Charlie Evans. I'm hanging on by the ivy and this leader, but I can't find anything above me to get a grip on.' "'Okay, boy. Let me get hold of your wrist. That's it. Mind you don't slip. The ivy has been cut away from the windows.' Bill pulled caught Charlie beneath his shoulders and lifted him over the sill. "'Get out of their line of fire,' he ordered. As quickly as possible, he closed both windows and pulled down the green shades. A moment later, he found the wall switch and flooded the room with light. Charlie, a round-faced, red-headed boy of twelve, still sat on the floor. He was soaked to the skin and breathing heavily. Bill gave him one look and disappeared into the bathroom. When he returned, he brought a glass of water with him. Charlie grabbed the tumbler and drained it in a few gulps. That's the berries, he wheezed. Got another? Soon, too much in a hurry will make you sick. Are you hurt? I mean, did those guys win you? I take it that you were the target they aimed at. I sure was, Bill, but they're rotten shots. Gee, I've had a time of it, I tell you. Can't I have another drink now? I've been running ever since they punctured the tires, and I'm dry as an empty well. All right, but take your time drinking it. Bill followed Charlie into the bathroom. You may be dry inside, but those clothes of yours are soaking wet. Get out of them and take a good rub down, and put on that bathrobe on the door. If I'm not in the bedroom when you're through, wait for me there. I'll be back as soon as possible. He went into the bedroom, and from there into the hall. A night light was burning at the foot of the staircase. Thunder still rumbled in the distance, but the storm was passing over. Bill ran lightly down to the lower floor. For a second, he hesitated, then went into the library on his right and shut the door behind him. The room was on the same side of the house as his bedroom. He went at once to a side window, and, pulling up the shade a couple of inches, peered into the night. For a time, he could see nothing. Then, as his eyes grew accustomed to the darkness, he made out the shadowy forms of six men in a group on the driveway near the house. While he watched, they separated, and one walked back to the entrance. The others took up positions behind the trees that lined the drive. Queer, muttered Bill. They evidently think he's coming out again. He pulled down the shade and went upstairs. 
charlie was curled up in an armchair wrapped in the bathrobe that was at least six sizes too big for him well what's up he asked as his tall broad-shouldered young friend came into the room they're posted along the drive gee we'll never get out of here to-night grumbled the youngster suppose said bill you start at the beginning and tell me why we have to leave here to-night what you're doing here in connecticut all about it in fact well let's see charlie yawned prodigiously i don't know where to start you don't have to start so very far back prompted bill we came up to new york from washington together a little over two weeks ago we sure did after you got that medal pinned on you by the president gosh i never thought i'd shake hands with the president of the united states and have him tell me i was a hero before all those people too it was swell maybe you thought so bill smiled wryly i didn't ah say what's become of osceola and the two heinies i'll tell you the dope later never mind that now i want to know how you happened to land in new canaan at this time of night and chased by a gang of thugs who don't mind trying to pot you what's the big idea oh all right all right keep your shirt on charlie yawned again after the big doings in washington mother and i went up to our summer place at marblehead dad didn't come with us he stayed in boston let's see today is tuesday wednesday morning interrupted bill with a glance at his wristwatch it's after two correct well last friday night mother got a telegram from dad telling her to send me up to clayton maine why that's the bird near twin heads harbor where we got the flying fish and the amtonia exclaimed bill in surprise yep that's the dump well mother didn't want to let me go alone but i went just the same dad said in his wire that nobody should come with me of course mother had a fit but dad had said it was important anyhow i got to clayton saturday night and dad met me with a car at the station he told me he had bought a house near the shore so we drove over there is the house anywhere near twin heads yes it stands back from a small cove about a mile south of the heads baron von heinskirk's old quarters at the other end of twin head harbor are about three miles away through the woods i guess and say bill that sure is some queer house why what's wrong with it oh the house is all right a big barn of a place but dad has it locked up like a prison there are solid wooden shutters to all the ground floor windows and he keeps them barred day and night we got in through an underground passage from the garage that does sound queer who else was there nobody dad's camping out in that house alone naturally i wanted to know all about it what did your father tell you not a darn thing he told me not to ask questions said the less i knew the better off i'd be sunday night somebody tried to break into the place dad fired at him through an upper window but the man got away i think it looks as if mr evans were hiding from something or somebody bill said thoughtfully it certainly does acquiesced charlie but i couldn't find out a thing he wouldn't let me go out of the house alone the whole time i was there funny business when did you leave monday night that noon after lunch dad told me to turn in and go to sleep said he had a job for me that night he woke me up for supper and afterwards he told me he wanted me to fetch you up there he said tell bolton i need him need him badly say that i know he will be going back to annapolis in about a month and i hate taking time from his holidays but tell him that this job won't take long and that i believe it will be even more exciting than that shell island business or the affair of the flying fish bill slapped his knee i'll go this is my lucky day what do you mean your lucky day my birthday kid that's what many happy returns grinned charlie and yawned how old does that make you seventeen replied bill and he too yawned 
that's the nerts sighed charlie i won't have one for four years what born on february twenty ninth yep ain't it the limit bill laughed too bad but did your father say anything else heaps about how i should drive to get here i was to drive all night go to the copley plaza in boston and sleep there tuesday tuesday night that's tonight i was to leave there at eight and take the post road to darien from there on he told me exactly how to find your house lucky he did i'd never have reached here after those bozos held up the car otherwise where was that just inside the new canaan line near that flying field i was making that right turn when a guy jumps into the road and holds up his hand what did you do gave her the gun of course but i missed him charlie said ruefully then two or three more of them started shooting when the tire burst i went into the ditch the car didn't turn over so i hopped it i kept in the shadows of the trees it was raining and black as your hat anyway soon a car passed me going slow didn't see hide nor hair of the bunch again until i climbed your stone wall then i ran smack into him you did surest thing you know we played hide and seek round the grounds then i saw your open window the storm broke about that time kind of upset them maybe anyhow i made for the ivy and well you know the rest good boy bill smiled and slapped him on the shoulder any further instructions from your dad he said we were to start back at once drive to boston sleep there tomorrow and drive up to maine tomorrow night he told me to hurry said that every hour counted and to bring along osceola if he was here the chief and my father went to new york for a few days they won't be home until the end of the week they may go to washington too some business connected with osceola's seminoles i'm alone here with the servants well it's too bad but we'll leave a note for him gee i'm sorry osceola would be just the guy for stuff like this but how can we make it bill take one of your old man's cars mine is a wreck down by the flying field we'll do better than a car pronounced his friend my loaning is stabled in the hangar she the amphibian that's right now we'll hunt you up some clothes get some chow leave that note for osceola and take off charlie jumped up from his chair but how can we how about that gang outside ask me something easy bill suggested and started to dress End of chapter one chapter two of bill bolton and hidden danger by noel sandsbury this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter two the getaway pretty as a picture said bill and laughed a picture no artist could paint declared charlie rather ruefully studying his reflection in the mirror arrayed in a jumper and sweater of bills and a pair of linen trousers converted into shorts by hacking off the legs above the knees he made a comical picture indeed i reckon said bill surveying him that you'll have to go barefoot okay returned charlie let's eat they went downstairs together and after raiding pantry and ice-box sat down at the kitchen table to a plentiful meal of bread and butter cold ham milk and cookies there's no sense waking the maids bill was talking with his mouth full the chauffeur took dad and osceola to the city and those girls are better off asleep if there's a row outside with that bunch when we go for the plane they'd probably raise the roof and start phoning for the cops and if mr evans had wanted the police to horn in on this business he'd have got hold of them long ago charlie finished his milk and attacked the ham again that's the way i figure it i wonder he took the chance of sending you though bill went on why couldn't he have telegraphed me or phoned me it would have been quicker dunno there's too much hush and rush about this whole business to suit me grunted young evans 
well shake a leg advised the older lad i'm going into the study to write a note to osceola and leave one for dad and the maids as well when i come back we've got to vamoose it'll be light soon why not wait for sun-up those lads can't very well stick around after daybreak no but if they've got a plane handy they can trail us and make it darn disagreeable at the other end perhaps they will anyway well we haven't taken off yet much less arrived come on eat you get no more food until we reach clayton you know bill faded away toward the front of the house and charlie started on the cookies ten minutes later bill was back again on his head was a soft leather helmet while strapped to his waist the butt of an automatic protruded from its leather holster he laid another flying helmet goggles and a small winchester repeating rifle on the kitchen table for you how's the tummy full enough just about grunted charlie stuffing the remainder of the cookies into his trousers pockets lead on macduffer he slapped the helmet and goggles onto his thatch of red hair and picked up the gun i left lights burning upstairs and in the study said bill we'll fool those guys yet it's the cellar for ours come along he waited at the foot of the stairs and beckoned to charlie give me your paw we daren't show glim down here young evans caught his hand in the inky darkness and presently bill stopped again released his hand and could be heard fumbling with something above their heads there she's open at last charlie thought he could make out a lightish blur on a level with bill's shoulders hand over the winchester his friend commanded and when you get through the window lie flat on the ground behind the rhododendrons and i'll pass it up don't go scouting round by yourself either wait for me charlie scrambled through the narrow aperture caught the rifle as it was handed up to him and crawling a foot or two along the side of the house lay still although it had stopped raining the ground was soaking wet above him the thick foliage of the rhododendrons dripped moisture with every breath of wind i might just as well have kept my own clothes he thought trying to accustom his eyes to the darkness but without success hang it all a little more crawling and i'll be sopping again a whisper in his ear startled him bill had reached him without a sound follow me keep on your hands and knees and don't breathe so hard i could hear you down in the cellar and i don't propose to have the show given away just because you ate too much come on and stay right behind me charlie gulped down a retort and followed bill's lead along the house behind the west shrubbery they had gone perhaps a hundred yards in this manner when bill turned to the left and crawled away through the bushes on an oblique from the house without stopping they crossed the drive where the hard gravel left its painful imprints on hands and knees and kept on through another belt of shrubbery beyond you can stand up now bill whispered and got to his feet we're in the back of the house those guys are posted in front and along the sides no they aren't not all of them down charlie keep where you are whatever happens footsteps crunched along the gravel on the drive both lads crouched low they saw a figure move out of the shadows and come directly toward them the man walked slowly humming a tune in the hollow of his arm he carried a rifle when he was within a couple of paces of them he turned on his heel and started back the way he had come bill was up on the instant he took three crouching steps and even charlie who watched with all his eyes and ears never heard a sound then he sprang on his prey up went his right arm and down the man dropped like a pole-axed ox bill dragged his body back to the bushes did you kill him charlie's voice came in a tense whisper bill snorted nothing like that kid i tapped him on the bean with my automatic he's out for half an hour or so but that's long enough for us you stop here and go through his pockets take any letters or papers he may have about him i'll be back in a jiffy but bill i don't like being left with a dead man can't cut it charlie if you don't obey orders you can hike back to the house what's the matter with you this is no time for fussing i told you the man's only stunned oh all right grumbled the boy i wasn't afraid of him 
honest i wasn't bill good carry on then said his friend as he melted into the bushes charlie bent over the man on the grass and consistently went through his pockets i bet osceola taught bill how to move that way he thought and if the chief ever gets up to maine i'm going to have him show me how to do it what are you mumbling about charlie jumped oh it's you bill gosh you gave me a scare what have you been doing setting a trap got his papers two letters that's all come along then we'll have to hurry he'll be missed soon here i'll tote his gun their course now led them back from the house through a copse of hemlock as they came out of the little wood charlie saw a blur of wooden buildings to the left on their right was a field of tall corn and between the two a broad stretch of greensward those are the barns and garage bill explained in answer to the boy's whispered question there's nobody out here yet i reconnoitred while you were frisking that fellow but we'd better go through the corn just the same what do you mean there's nobody here yet the bus is parked in the hangar wait till that nice inverted engine gets talking think there'll be a fight charlie was running now it was hard going in the cornfield between the tall stalks he stumbled frequently his long-legged friend seemed to know by instinct just where to plant his feet well i don't know it all depends on how fast they can run and which way they come bill stopped on the edge of the field and waited for charlie before them now lay a broad meadow over to the left the dark shape of a building was visible is that the hangar puffed the youngster yep yeah, it used to be a hay barn but when i got my pilot's license dad had it fixed up with a concrete floor and a tin roof the loaning and the ryan are both in there well i don't see anybody around let's make a dash for it gosh that's all i've been doing lately that and eating chuckled bill on your toes fat boy he sprinted across the open space and had the hangar doors open when charlie arrived puffing and half-winded by his efforts to make fast time slow but sure teased bill you're better at tucking away chow than you are at track work charles ah cut it out how do you expect me to keep pace with the navy star end never mind you did fine lend me a hand and we'll wheel out the loaning charlie pointed to the monoplane isn't that orion m one sure is come and get busy but that type is faster than the loaning why not take her because my boy she can't land on water more than once that's why it may come in mighty handy to have an amphibian up there on the main shore and don't think for a minute this biplane can't travel wait till you ride in her and see when they had wheeled the plane out on the concrete apron bill went back and swung the door shut and locked them charlie was already seated aft when bill climbed into the fore cockpit and adjusted his helmet goggles and safety belt okay he asked the youngster okay safety belt fastened you bet fine keep that rifle handy if those lads get too close let her go i will bill you can trust me bill snapped on the ignition the propeller swung into motion as the inertia starter did the trick the engine sputtered then roared he slipped into a heavy flying jacket as the engine warmed up charlie he knew had already donned his in the rear cockpit the engine was roaring smoothly as bill fitted the phones over his helmet and adjusted the receivers over his ear flaps a mouthpiece hung on his chest and a wire ran back to the headset that charlie wore this would allow them to talk in the air even with the coughing bark of the engine through the exhausts bill stared up at the white fleecy cloud rolling in over the field then he twisted his head in the direction of the house and cut down the throttle speed here they come charlie he said evenly better get that rifle ready end of chapter two chapter three of 
bill bolton and hidden danger by noel sainsbury this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. chapter three into the air the lights of the car swung round the hemlocks then leveled directly on the field as the automobile sped down the stretch of lawn between the stables and the cornfield better get off bill they'll get us sure charlie's treble shrieked into the receiver's clamped to bill's ears no they won't and for the love of mike charlie don't shout like that well what's to stop them that said bill briefly the speeding motor car bucked like a live thing described a half-circling dive in the air and crashed down sideways to its former course the headlights snapped out and both lads felt the tremor of a dull explosion jiminy somebody got hurt cried young evans hope so that as the story-books say was my intention but what what made it happen remember when i left you by the bushes and you went through the gunman's pockets sure well just about then i was stringing a wire between the old hitching post and the horse trough looks to me as if the wire held oh blazes he broke off here comes another car hadn't counted on a fleet of them reckon you were right charles we should have got going sooner while he talked bill swung the plane into the wind i thought they might stop at the wreck sighed charlie cold-blooded i call it shall i shoot their jobs to stop us gosh no you'd be wasting ammunition never hit within forty feet of them with all this jouncing the amphibian was gathering speed rolling lightly over the turf but leaping and bouncing the motor car drew closer it came alongside the moving plane not more than five yards off its starboard wing two men hung to the running board their guns spurting fire duck yelled bill he deliberately leaned over the cockpit side and fired his automatic at the automobile he saw the big machine swerve wildly fall behind and topple over tit for tat bill lifted his plane prettily off the ground that's one for you charlie i caught him in the near tire two to one you mean and their cars are in a lot worse shape than mine the engine was beating a steady tattoo bill opened her up wide and pulled back on the stick almost immediately they were in fog but he was no novice at the gentle art of piloting an airplane he had his air sense flying sense and two instruments on the lighted dial board to guide him the level glasses helped a lot his eyes went to the angle of climb indicator the bank indicator he held the amphibian in a steady climb for altitude the air was rough white clouds of fog obscured the wing lights at times at other times it was thinner the engine was roaring steadily but bill knew the danger of taking off and climbing directly into a change of temperature he sat tight for about four minutes they climbed in a wide circle and then there came a break in the fog a slice of the moon showed to the southward it was smothered by another layer of fog almost instantly the altimeter showed eighteen hundred feet charlie's voice sounded through the receivers of the phone set are you lost bill his voice sounded scared not yet reassured his friend i'm looking for something had to gain altitude to put those guys off our track if they happen to have an airbus handy bill dropped the plane into the heavier fog below still flying in wide spirals he came out of it with the altimeter needle pointing to four hundred feet there she is almost directly below them the bright beam of a flashing light circled round and round cutting the night in a broad swath what is it asked charlie the new cannon air beacon on ponus ridge we take our bearings from that light where do we go from here hartford worcester lowell portland and on up the main coast any idea of the distance 
We're a couple of hundred miles from Lowell, and Portland is a good hundred and twenty-five from that place. From there up to Washington County and Twin Heads Harbor is between a hundred and fifty to a hundred and seventy-five farther. Say about five hundred miles altogether. That's guesswork. It's probably farther. He banked the plane, swung it around in a semicircle, and leveled off headed into the northeast how long will it take us bill heard a half-stifled yawn at the end of charlie's question well it's going on for three now if this breeze on our tail stiffens we ought to make your dad's house in less than five hours say somewhere between seven thirty and eight o'clock if we're lucky too bad we have to get there in broad daylight dad won't like that maybe not but he's lucky we're getting there at all i'll say he is yawned charlie say kid you'd better take a nap take down your seat and curl up on the decking you'll find a couple of blankets stowed behind the bulkhead aft i guess that's the best thing to do the youngster said sleepily i know it is said bill keep that phone gear on your head though i've got to wake you before we get there you'll have to point out the house sure nighty night good night and sweet dreams bill nosed up to six hundred feet above him the clouds of swirling fog seemed less dense his course led inland on a slant from the shore new cannon lies up in the ridge country five or six miles back from long island sound with every mile he put between the plain and that body of water the air both below and above him became clearer and less bumpy by the time the amphibian was flying over hartford three-quarters of an hour later all signs of fog and storm had disappeared moonlight flooded the earth and the visibility was almost as good as on a clear day it was past five o'clock by his wrist-watch and broad daylight when the amphibian speeding at the same altitude passed over the city of lowell massachusetts and over lawrence and haverhill a few miles beyond they were nearing the sea again and bill noticed that the closer they came to the coast the stronger was the wind from the southwest behind them a new thought came into his head with a quick decision of the trained heavier-than-air pilot he acted at once out came his map which he flattened on his knees next the cockpit light snapped on for a moment he studied his position then the light went off and the map into the pocket of his short leather jacket the amphibian was a trifle tail heavy so dropping the nose to level he gave her right aileron and simultaneously increased right rudder round to the right swung the nose of the speeding plane when the desired bank was reached he checked the wings with the ailerons and at the same time eased the pressure on the rudder half a moment later he applied left aileron and left rudder resuming straight flight headed towards the coast on a course that would take them fifty miles east of portland with wings level once more he neutralized the ailerons gave the bus a normal amount of right rudder and settled back comfortably in his seat the little port of cushing just beyond where the merrimack river empties into the sea faded away behind them below nose was the blue atlantic dotted here and there with the patched sails of fishermen returning with the night's catch far to the starboard hugging the horizon bill saw a large single stacker a freighter heading so as to clear cape ann on her way to boston the day had dawned bright and clear it was perfect flying weather with a twenty-mile breeze spanking their tailplane bill knew that they must be doing at least one hundred and fifty-five miles per hour he felt the exhilaration of broad spaces and swift flight the salt tang of the sea smelled good he was content half an hour or so went by a sleepy voice in bill's receivers roused him from reverie where under the shining sun are we just there or thereabouts gee are we heading for europe nope for breakfast i hope but what are we doing over the ocean bill 
taking a shortcut kid this course will lop off a good hundred and fifty miles from the route via portland and up the coast i suppose it was the sea fog that made you figure on the other way when we hopped off bill laughed good-naturedly <laughs> you show almost human intelligence this morning charles you'll be telling me next that the sun is shining and the prop is turning round charlie snorted ah cut it out bill tell me is there anything i can eat on board this crate not unless you start on a strut the french have a saying that who sleeps dines if that is so you ought to be filled to the brim huh. was charlie's sole comment then he asked what are those islands ahead to port matinicus island and matinicus rock how much farther is it to the heads about a hundred miles our airspeed is a hundred and thirty five miles per hour and we're running before a twenty knot wind figure it out for yourself do you want the answer in acres the answer i want said bill slowly is how i am going to land and park this bus when we get there if some more of your cutthroat pals are hanging round the house i never thought of that admitted charlie i didn't think you would turn your mighty brain on it if you guess the right answer i'll ask mr evans to give you a lollipop bill paid no attention to the forthcoming torrent of sarcasm from charlie his headphone set lay on the floor of the cockpit End of chapter three chapter four of bill bolton and hidden danger by noel sainsbury this flipper box recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. chapter four gaining an ally twin heads charlie said bill resuming his headphone some time later the lining was flying in from the atlantic bill had thought it wiser than trailing up the coast for all eyes to see our house is over there to the left on the other side of those woods returned his companion from the rear cockpit did you find the answer old groucho no i did not fat boy as the poet has it we'll be guided by circumstances as we find them he banked to port and leveling off sent the amphibian speeding over the treetops in the direction indicated he was flying low now barely a hundred and fifty feet above the ground his intention was to make a quick landing if things looked propitious rather than to advertise their presence to these mysterious enemies of mr evans by spiraling down from a higher altitude there's the house called charlie in a clearing bill caught sight of a large red brick mansion with jutting wings and high gables all the windows were closely shuttered the house stood back quite close to the woods amid unkempt lawns and shrubbery a broad avenue lined with maples led across the clearing into the forest he caught a glimpse as they shot over of stables and a smaller building also of red brick two or three hundred yards to the left of the house and there's dad see him shouted charlie a man walked from the front of the house across the drive and stood watching them yes i see him retorted bill but stop your shouting or i'll be deaf for a week when we come back strip your headgear and stand up so he can recognize you hold on tight though it will be rough going pulling back the stick he climbed to five hundred feet then leveling off he made a quick flipper turn over the farther woods and headed back toward the house nosing downward throttle wide open just before reaching the garage he zoomed missing the roof by inches as he banked again to circle back charlie's excited voice spoke through his receivers he saw me he saw me look at him now has he gone crazy or what did you ever see anything so silly waving his arms around his head like a windmill shut up he's wigwagging banked to an angle of forty-five degrees bill kept the plane describing a tight circle directly above the garage 
spelling out mr evans signals the while presently he waved his understanding of the message leveled his wings and neutralizing his ailerons headed the plane out to sea what's the matter what did he say piped charlie his exact words returned bill patiently were park plane clayton walk back after dark enter through garage then why on earth are we shooting off in the opposite direction because young master mind it's a lead pipe cinch we're being watched from the woods probably maybe they'll think we're out for a transatlantic record i hope so the last place we want them to think of at the present time in connection with this plane is clayton bill kept the amphibian headed out to sea for the next half hour convinced at last that they were well beyond the ken of mr evans enemies he banked to starboard and headed his airbus on a course at right angles to the last leg he continued to fly in this direction for some twenty miles then turned back toward the coast again when at last they passed over the shore line once more it was at a point thirty miles along the coast from twin heads and the evans house bill steered his craft inland turned right again and came in sight of their destination as the hands of his wristwatch marked ten o'clock clayton has a small airport said charlie tentatively thanks for that if you told me before you'd have saved me some worry the last thing we want to do is to advertise the loaning in this neck of the woods if we had to come down in a farmer's meadow it would have been all over town in half an hour they were over the landing field now and as bill circled the plane preparatory to their descent he saw that it was little more than a meadow a mile out of town with hangar capable of housing three or four planes the flat roof of this building was painted black large block letters in white paint proclaimed the legend parker's air drum clayton maine near the highway that led into the town and separated from the landing field by a white picket fence stood a small farmhouse as bill swung his bus into the wind and nosed over he saw a man open the gate in the fence and walk toward the hangar the wheels of the loanings retractable landing gear touched the ground the plane rolled forward and came to a stop on the concrete apron of the hangar before its open doors very pretty very pretty indeed remarked the individual who had come through the gate he was a tall rangy man of about thirty wearing overalls much the worse for grease and hard usage bill and charlie climbed down and walked over to him good morning and thanks smiled bill my name is bolton mr parker isn't it it pays to advertise grinned the lanky individual and he gripped bill's extended hand with a horny fist pock is the name i guess by the way you brought that loaning down it isn't flight instruction you're after no said bill not this time what i need is gas and oil and a place to park the bus for a few days can you fix me up sure can mister business round here this summer is deader than a doornail especially in my line want the bus filled up looked over and put ship shape i take it that's it one of her plugs is carbonized a bit i'd attend to it myself only i'm too sleepy we've been in the air most of the night anywhere we can turn in for a few hours our friends don't expect us till this evening well i can rent you the spare room over to the house for as long as you want it and how about something to eat before you turn in lead me to it charlie spoke up for the first time good enough parker chuckled come on mrs p will be glad to dish up something tasty for ye fellows the parker homestead proved to be as neat and clean as a new pen mrs parker a buxom young woman with dimples and a jolly smile served the hungry lads with wheat cakes and coffee until they couldn't eat another mouthful then she led them upstairs to the low-ceiled bedroom where two white beds invited them to rest she promised to call them at seven that evening and left them five minutes later bill and charlie were sound asleep seven o'clock time to get up 
called a cheery voice which bill sleepily realized was mrs parker's all right thanks he called back be down in a jiffy and would it be too much trouble to fix us a couple of sandwiches before we start ezra and i said mrs parker from the other side of the closed door figured as how you'd be wanting something we're waiting supper for you and there's a shower bath at the end of the hall plenty of hot water if you want it we certainly do called bill thanks a lot mrs parker we'll make it snappy he leaned over and picked up a rubber sneaker a moment later it bounced off of charlie's red head eventually bringing that young man back from dreamland supper with the parkers was a pleasant affair when it was over bill had some little trouble to make mrs parker accept payment for their entertainment he guessed however that their financial condition was none of the best so when she asked him if a dollar would be too much he pressed a five spot on the astonished young matron and refused to take change while he went out to assist parker in an inspection of the loaning charlie not to be outdone in gallantry insisted on helping wash the dishes out in the hangar bill came to the decision on a question he had been considering throughout the meal ezra parker and his pretty wife were an honest wholesome pair he needed someone in clayton whom he could trust and so he came at once to the point mr parker i need a friend he said quietly i dare say you aren't averse to making some extra money ezra smiled and laid a hand on his shoulder i like you the minute i'd set eyes on you this morning bill he declared i guess there need be no mention of money in our friendship perhaps not but this friendship has a job attached to it and you told me when i landed that business was none too good well that's a fact boy mrs p and i have had a hard time to make both ends meet this summer anything short of robbery or murder with a dollar or two tacked on to it will be a godsend our savings are tied up in this little property and we hate to give it up but there's been many little joy flying or anything else in this line of business since the depression it's beginning to look as if we'd have to let the place go unless something turns up soon so i can't say i'm not anxious to make some ready money this job said bill is worth five hundred a month but you'd be expected to keep a closed head about anything that might come up ezra stared at him in amazement you're a millionaire in disguise no only a midshipman on summer vacation but mr evans has plenty and he is going to pay your salary gosh you're the guy that put the lid on von heimskuck and his pirates over to twin heads harbor i helped some bill admitted i'll say you did what's this job more pirates no i don't think so to be truthful the whole thing is much of a mystery to me so far well ezra affirmed i never earned five hundred a month in my life one month's work will put mrs p and me on velvet then listen bill gave him a sketch of affairs to date i know the place mr evans bought said ezra when he finished used to belong to old joe tanner who died last year they say there's secret rooms underground passages and all manner of queer things about that house i expect it's all lies but no telling mr evans can't be up against that heinzka gang the government cleaned them up good and plenty well he's up against somebody equally unpleasant i've had a taste of them already are you really game for the job i sure am what do you want me to do first take this ezra took the money albeit reluctantly what's all this for he asked counting the bills oil gas your time on the bus and two weeks salary don't you think it's dangerous carrying a roll that would choke a horse i'm not in the habit of it laughed bill it was a birthday present from my father don't worry mr evans will reimburse me but maybe suggested ezra doubtfully he may not be as strong on the deal he asked for my help returned bill and this is part of it 
you've got a car of some sort about the place i suppose of oh, some sort describes it want me to run you over to turner's yes but only to where the turner road branches out of the one to twin heads harbor right bill before we start hadn't you better tell me what you want me to do we can talk about that on the way over said his young employer why you're dragging out the flue or the shed or whatever it is i'll get hold of charlie and say good-bye to mrs parker ezra chuckled she'll be some happy girl when i tell her what you've done the three of us will get kissed good and proper i don't mind if you don't laughed bill and went toward the house End of chapter four chapter five of bill bolton and hidden danger by noel saintsbury this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Chapter 5. Strange Doings at Turner's. The flipper pulled up at the side of the dirt road and stopped. Ezra Parker, behind the wheel, switched off the motor and likewise the lights. Patches of moonlight filtered through the interlocking branches that arched the grass-grown highway. These silvery patches seemed but to deepen the velvety black of the woods after the noisy chugging of four ancient cylinders the silence of the forest was oppressive yonder's the road to tanna's ezra volunteered pointing toward a narrow track choked with weeds which led off to the right the house is two or three miles farther on i know i've been over it twice in a car and gee whiz it sure is a tough one to drive piped charlie from the back seat we've got to hop it now said bill hand me the extra rifle and come on followed by young evans he stepped down to the roadway so long fellows ezra bade them better watch your step when you get near tanis we will returned bill got the times fixed in your mind ezra and all the rest of the instructions you bet i'll write them down soon as i get home don't worry i won't let you fellows down he backed the car across the road swung round his front wheels and chugged off in the direction of clayton and that's that said bill i hope dad will approve said charlie bill's face took on a look of grim determination in the darkness it's just too bad if he doesn't don't shoulder that rifle charlie it's likely to hit a branch and go off hold it in the hollow of your arm like i'm carrying mine keep three or four paces behind me and remember no more talking until we are inside the garage if you see me drop down flop okay grunted the youngster on your way if anybody spots us it won't be my fault they strode down the road toward turner's for a mile or more neither the tall lad nor the short one uttered a word bill drank in the crisp cool night air pleasant after the dusty highway on either hand dense woods shut out the moonlight directly overhead however light filtered between the treetops flecking the overgrown trail with splotches of silver when they came to an open wood lot bill paused yes i think from what ezra said we go to the left here we'll see where it lands us shortly after passing around the field a dense wood of pines showed up against the moonlight on their right hand between them and the pines was a broad stone fence we'll hang out here for a few minutes bill remarked there's nothing like making quite certain if you hear anyone following charlie it means we were noticed in the car and we're probably in for a rousing time after an interval he got up and stretched himself gave a curt order and plunged abruptly into the heart of the woods bill had no idea how far they penetrated but they appeared to go forward for a good fifteen minutes before they struck upon a grass-grown avenue or drive among the trees and at the end of it they saw a clearing both lads stopped a gentle wind stirred in the treetops and above its rustle they suddenly heard the soft wash of the sea bill turned and charlie followed his gaze set back quite close to the woods amid overgrown lawns and shrubbery 
there glimmered in the pallid moonlight the outlines of a house turner's whispered bill as charlie came close it looked different from the air but i guess it's the place all right sure and there's the garage see it come along emerging stealthily from the trees he quickly glanced about crossed the path cut in behind a screen of shrubbery and made his way round the side of the house to the garage without hesitation he went forward pulled the right-hand door slightly ajar and slipped in with charlie at his heels the darkness closed in upon them just a moment and i'll be with you a cautious voice spoke nearby and bill recognized it as mr evans the door behind them shut with a slight click and bill felt one of his hands caught in a firm grasp charlie take bill's other hand we won't show a light just yet come this way they passed on until they came to what bill decided was a closet in one corner of the garage he heard mr evans open a door and at the same time he spoke again shut the door after you charlie and see that the lock snaps there are twelve steps down bill come along the youngster knows his way from here bill still grasping mr evans hand felt for the first step found it and descended after his guide on level ground once more he counted eighty-four paces and two turns in the dark tunnel before he was led up a flight of twenty-two steps at the farther end there came a pause followed by a click then he was pulled gently forward and his hand released he waited then a leaping shaft of light from a single unshaded lamp disclosed a large and soundly furnished room with books lining the walls and deep armchairs grouped about on a table in the centre were a large plate of sandwiches some glasses and several bottles of ginger ale me for that cried charlie his face shining in anticipation that boy's head is in his stomach declared mr evans but i suppose at his age i was always hungry too well i'm glad to see both of you i need your help bill because i can't drag in the police on this matter at least not yet they would spoil everything help yourself from the table lad before charlie gobbles up all the sandwiches then tell me about your trip something happened to the car or did you think your plane would prove the more useful both said bill from the table where he was pouring himself a glass of ginger ale taking a couple of sandwiches he went over to an armchair and sank back in its comfortable depths your friends or enemies or whoever they are he went on munching as he talked are quite active around new canaan they made things hum for a while and wrecked your car into the bargain if their shooting hadn't been putrid you'd be minus a son now mr evans it's not my place to criticize but don't you think it was pretty risky sending a boy his age on such a dangerous undertaking mr evans started up from his chair in consternation you don't mean they tried to shoot the boy i certainly do mean just that the father put an arm about his son's shoulders and held him close the devils he muttered i've no idea they would dare resort to such methods if i had he never would have been sent and i don't blame you bill for thinking me a heartless parent if anything had happened to this boy but there's no sense in making excuses now tell me just what happened he carted charlie sandwiches and ginger ale over to his chair and deposited them there seating himself on the broad arm at his son's side well the first i knew of it began bill and continued with a recitation of their adventures since the thunderstorm had awakened him the night before when he had finished he got up to replenish his glass splendid i'm extremely proud of you both now tell me of the arrangements you've made with parker starting to-morrow night he is to fly the loaning over this property if he sees a light in the garage he will know that we want him he will then continue on his way out to sea for a few miles come back over twin heads and land in the harbor near the channel that leads out to the atlantic we will get in touch with him there in any case unless he is molested he is to wait on the water until daylight and if we do not need him what then why the garage will be dark and he'll go out to sea swing round and go back to clayton did you arrange any set time for his flights yes 
to-morrow he will be over this house at midnight the next night at one o'clock the night after at two and the following one at three then he starts all over again i arranged his trips in that order so that anyone spying would not be able to count on a set time mr evans nodded his approval that is very satisfactory bill you think parker is to be trusted of course i'm sure of it sir hope you don't think i met his salary at too high a figure i'll double it if he proves useful mr evans declared now get off my knee charlie while i pay bill back for what he has spent on my account he dug into a trousers pocket fished out a roll of bills and handed it to bill that's what i owe you and keep the balance for expenses you may need it before long thanks sir bill pocketed the money can you tell us something of what we're up against sir mr evans glanced at his watch goodness it's time you fellows were in bed i'll go into details bill after breakfast but dad we slept all day charlie expostulated never mind son you won't be the worse for a few hours more we'll all need clear wits in the morning beckoning the lads to follow he went to the door their feet echoed on the polished tiles of the hall a vast place which looked like a black cavern above them the dim shape of a wide staircase beyond following mr evans lead they mounted the stairs his flashlight flickering on the thick carpet and heavy oak banisters in the corridor above he stopped and flung open a door they entered a large square bedroom twin beds stood against opposite walls and heavy dark hangings concealed the windows these curtains mr evans drew back and through the shutters there gleamed the faint gray light of a waning moon a solitary night owl made eerie music in the woods sleep well said charlie's father i'll call you two at seven we'll have breakfast and i'll explain my problem to you good night good night dad good night sir mr evans departed with a wave of his hand i forgot to say he added putting his head inside the door again if you wake earlier than seven don't raise a row no bursting into happy song charlie he grinned at his son nodded and was gone bill sat down on his bed and took off his shoes i wonder why he warned us about noise he remarked as he struggled with a nod ask me something easy yawned charlie you'll soon find out that there's more hush stuff about this house than there is at a funeral cheerful simile grunted bill he dropped a shoe stripped off his outer garments and got into bed wearing his underclothes he was dreaming of masked foes who kept climbing up from airy depths to creep on him unawares when one of these fiends clutched him by the shoulder suddenly he found himself sitting up in bed shaking with a terror of nightmare are you dead or what charlie stood beside him and leaned over to shake him again through partly opened shutters daylight streamed into the room i'm awake said bill with an effort what time is it anyway nearly nine o'clock that's why i'm worried i just woke up myself dad hasn't called us or come near us yet do you suppose something has happened to him bill bill jumped out of bed wait till i get some clothes on then we'll find out end of chapter five chapter six of bill bolton and hidden danger by noel sainsbury this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. chapter six watchers in the trees where's your father's room bill stepped into the corridor charlie at his heels there that one opposite the door is open he isn't there i looked before i woke you the bed hasn't been slept in either come along downstairs he may be there bill had had an impression the night before of the solid comfort of the house but it was not until they descended the great oak staircase in the morning that he realized in spite of dust sheets how exquisitely the place was appointed in true manorial style armor hung in the hall marble busts gleamed against the dark beautifully carved panelling and half a dozen riding crops dangled from a pair of antlers over the low fireplace here charlie took the lead 
they went first to the library with its secret door in the panelling through which they had entered the house from the garage a flashlight lay on the table amongst the remains of the sandwiches bill appropriated it and after charlie had opened the sliding door by twisting a knob on the fireplace they investigated the tunnel and its outlet but the garage and the underground passage were empty of any human being they returned to the library and made a round of the rooms on that floor a small den two large living rooms and a dining room all the furniture was shrouded in dust covers the rooms looked gloomy and unlived in scarcely any light came through the closed shutters bill's feeble flashlight seemed to accentuate the cavernous depths of the huge apartments a back passage led them to the pantry and immense stone-floored kitchen on a table near the sink an unwashed plate and cup told the story of eggs and coffee bill turned to the boy there on a bet he ate and went out hadn't we better go over the rest of the house though there was a slight tremor in charlie's voice this place is creepy it was like that when i was here before i never opened a door but would i expect a dead man to walk out on me that laughed bill would take some doing you'll be telling me the house is haunted next it is oh go on there ain't no such animals as ghosts you're losing your nerve kid you probably heard a rat in the walls rat nothing if it wasn't a ghost who was in our room just before daylight it wasn't dad i called and the figure just disappeared mm, that's funny perhaps some friend of your father's and they went off together later charlie shook his head solemnly dad hasn't any friends up here bill or he wouldn't have had to call on you but suppose it was a friend he went away with why didn't he let us know i'll just bet dad's in this house right now down cellar or upstairs with his throat cut like as not charlie was in tears now here here now stop it you certainly are a cheerful kid this morning i don't think bill scoffed and patted him on the back detective thrillers and too much food are what ails you imagination plus indigestion will make anybody see or hear a lot of things how do i get down to the cellar if you're afraid of meeting more spooks you'd better stay here no no i'll go with you replied charlie so hurriedly that bill burst out laughing come on then big boy charlie's mournful face made him feel ashamed of his mirth i don't like this big lonely house any more than you do but we'll go down into the cellar just the same although i haven't the slightest doubt but that your father left this place hours ago an inspection of the cellars and the two upper stories proved conclusively to bill that except for themselves there was nobody in the house however they found food and plenty of it in the storage rooms a whole closet full of canned goods eggs bread and a couple of hams and four or five slabs of bacon well old man let's have a shower suggested bill and then i'll rustle some breakfast charlie smiled and turned on a tap at the kitchen sink a faint trickle came from the faucet you'll get no shower or bath while you're in this house he announced the water comes from a well and there's something wrong with the pump dad says the water supply is likely to give out any time bill made a grimace how do you take baths then when i was here before we went down to the cove but never until after dark gee whiz a swim is just what i need i'll tell you what charlie we'll have something to eat take a more careful look for any message your father may have left and then we'll romp down to that cove of yours okay by me bill let's get the grub i could eat a horse when couldn't you bill snorted as they started after the food when they had eaten and washed up at the kitchen sink bill instituted a thorough search for the message in their bedroom and in the library it's no use he said at last there just isn't any message and that's that i vote we pop down to the cove and have our dip now is it much of a jaunt oh no charlie turned from peering through the curtains at the sunshine 
we can get into the shrubbery at the back door and keep under cover pretty well all the time we'll be taking chances though dad wouldn't let us go until after dark well he isn't here bill said casually i'm going for a swim you can stay here though if you want to not me declared the boy i'd rather be shot than stay in this house alone where do we go from the grounds right through the trees until we come to a rough sort of lane it leads from the main road down to a little bay that's just the place for a swim fine now listen to me kid if we happen to run into anybody and can't make a bunk without being seen we'll go right up and speak to them openly there's no sense in arousing suspicions or showing that we have any we'll say we're on a walking tour along the coast and saw the lane leading down to the sea sabe you betcha and oh bill i forgot to say that we can't swim out far dad told me that the currents round the point are the dickens and all armed with towels and soap they let themselves out by the back door and darted into the bushes with charlie in the lead they pushed through the trees keeping a sharp lookout presently they reached the lane and without sighting a single creature they found themselves on the beach the sand shelled down into a little bay which was about a hundred yards across great rocks crowded down into the water on either side the place was embowered in trees and bushes it was an ideal spot for a quiet dip both lads slipped off their clothes and entered the water the sea was perfect charlie who wasn't much on aquatics paddled about near shore but bill soon found himself at the mouth of the bay swimming strongly with an easy crawl stroke he reveled in the electric chill of the water and the cloudless sky and sunshine a short distance ahead of him a huge brown rock jutted up from the water like a boy he swam to it and clambered up on its grind shoulder slippery with endless laving of the sea standing upright he gazed about up and down the beach the tumbled rocks were belted with trees for some miles beyond the trees so far as he could see were the bare sharp outlines of tall cliffs overhanging the water picturesque enough thought bill but immeasurably lonesome out to sea an island lay off the coast a mile perhaps two miles away he could not judge accurately for it was difficult to decide distance from the level of the water he remembered seeing it the day before from the air as he remembered it it was a small rocky barren-looking place with a single house on it though he hadn't been absolutely certain about the house he stared in that direction for a minute or two as he turned about ready to dive in and return to shore there was a sharp thud on the rock at his feet bill looked down but saw nothing the next moment he heard or imagined he heard something go past his ear with a whistling sound he gazed toward the beach more than a little disturbed nothing could be seen but charlie sitting naked on the sand there was no stir of bush not a movement of grass and yet again above his head and this time closer there was a harsh zip of a bullet bill heard no sound of an explosion but suddenly he saw charlie spring to his feet snatch up his clothes and dart into the underbrush the only conclusion he could reach as he stood on the sea-washed rock hurriedly collecting his thoughts was that someone concealed ashore was shooting at him with a powerful air-gun without a second's further hesitation he flopped into the water he had intended to swim back to the little bay but now he hastily changed his mind to return in that direction while the bullets were flying was like asking for a sudden and unpleasant end to his existence so he struck out to sea meaning to take a detour and go ashore at some secluded spot a little further down the coast he was swimming with his head submerged in the water in order to conceal his whereabouts if possible from the beach when he turned on his back to take his bearings he remembered charlie's warning about the current it seemed to him as he glanced back to the rock where he had stood that he had covered a great distance in a very short time even allowing for the extra speed due to his excitement and wrath over the unknown marksman's attempt to drop him in the water with a bullet he fixed his eyes on a point on the shore and struck out with all his might 
at first bill could not believe that his tremendous efforts were achieving nothing but gradually after a fierce fight of more than a quarter of an hour's duration the truth broke upon him his distance from the beach was not lessening at all but was swiftly increasing he could battle as he liked against it but the tide was stronger stronger than he there was no shadow of a doubt in his mind that he was being carried out to sea it was difficult to meet the situation calmly but bill tried to quiet the surge of pain that was sucking the strength from his limbs it looked as though only a miracle would save him now he turned on his back and for a moment a ray of hope sent a warm glow through his veins he was being borne out on the tide toward the island it might be possible to force a landing there now that seemed his only prospect of life with all the vigor he could summon bill struck across the current but when he paused in exhaustion to observe his progress he saw that it was useless he had already been swept past the island it was out of his range wearily bill shut his eyes gasping for breath and felt the power melting away from his numbed limbs then hazily he noticed that the island seemed nearer or was that but a last illusion before the end no the rocks were towering above him he realized that he had been swept around on the current to the seaward side and that the mainland was out of sight with his last atom of strength he tried to strike out toward that shore but the place seemed to be slipping away from him again there was a throbbing in his ears growing louder and louder a vague dreamlike impression of touching the gray side of some craft then his senses left him End of chapter six chapter seven of bill bolton and hidden danger by noel sainsbury this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard chapter seven the mysterious trio the whitewashed wooden walls of the hut and a sickly sting of brandy in his throat were bill's first impressions of life on awakening an old brown face with blue eyes and a tuft of white beard below the chin looked down at him you're better the man said grimly but i caught sight of you none too soon where am i bill managed to ask never mind drink this as the man lifted a tin of boiling coffee from a little stove bill saw that he was lean and lanky and dressed in a sailor's blue jersey and top boots it's heat you need not information bill sat up a warm sweater and flannel trousers now covered him and by the time he had finished the coffee he felt more like taking a sane interest in his surroundings he was about to try to express his thanks to the old man when there was a knock on the door the old fellow opened the door and stepped outside a girl stood in the doorway she was dressed in a white skirt and sweater she had a smooth olive skin and her black hair was cut close to her head bill decided that she was pretty and that she must be about sixteen her eyes were smiling at him as he got to his feet please sit down she cried for bill was gripping a beam at his side to steady himself why you must be feeling perfectly dreadful aren't you hungry won't you let me get you something to eat bill was sure he detected the faintest shadow of a foreign accent in her speech he smiled in a little while perhaps thank you he said my head is a bit on the blink i don't know how i'll ever be able to thank that old man oh jim won't want any thanks he'll be offended if you try to thank him he saw you from the motor boat he's a gruff old tar but he's as good as gold it was lucky for me that there was somebody here i suppose i'm on the island you are there's the beach where jim brought you in she pointed through the open door are you yachting up this way ventured bill good gracious no cried the girl i live here live here bill repeated in astonishment why in the world she laughed softly well i suppose i like it i have a bungalow back in the hollow this is really jim's bunk he sleeps in there but you haven't told me about yourself where did you come from the innocent question caught bill up short oh i'm on a walking tour 
he said as steadily as he could then smiled wanly at his joke i i went down to the shore for a swim and that confounded current got me i thought i was bound for davy jones all right where did you go for a bath she asked anxiously it seemed to him oh there's a little bay at the end of a lane off the main road to clayton and the sea looked so tempting i couldn't resist it did you did you see anybody in the woods as you came along she gave him a quick glance not a soul if i drowned my clothes would have lain on the shore for weeks she nodded it's a lovely old place turner's she remarked casually oh so that is its name you've seen it then the house among the trees well i came past it you know he dissembled i got only a glimpse of it the girl looked at him sharply the carefree expression gone from her eyes she stared at him for several minutes how long have you been on your walking tour she asked suddenly oh about a week he answered easily i the girl drew herself up i want to know the truth her voice sounded a challenge your name is harold johnson and you flew up here night before last from stamford connecticut bill was astounded still limp and sick from his exertions in the water this declaration half truth that it was literally took his breath away of course she was mistaken in the name but stamford is only five or six miles from new cannon did she take him for some one else or had she only got the name wrong in either case would it be wise to reveal his real identity what if she were one of those working against mr evans yet she was but a young girl and these enemies of charlie's father had already proven themselves to be villains of the first water weak as he was bill's brain was unable to cope with the problem his bewilderment was evidently clearly written on his face for he could see a slow smile appearing in the girl's eyes as she stood in the doorway and looked down on him i notice you don't deny it mr johnson she remarked abruptly bill shook his head i don't see the good of denying it he replied quietly you appear to know all about me but as a point of interest i'd be glad to know how you got your information no doubt it's a point of great interest to you she said with deliberation but you really can't expect me to answer that question to tell the truth i was a little doubtful about you at first i only mentioned your name to make quite certain who you were but now we know what to do and that is ah but you go too fast she took a step nearer and her voice softened mr johnson why did you decide to come to maine do you really think it is going to bring you luck bill looked at her closely unable to decide what was in her mind perhaps her object was to sound him delicately on how much he really knew he did not reply well she went on and her tone was low and serious if i were you i wouldn't be too sure about that luck some things you know are better left alone frankly i don't get you said bill and that my meaning is perfectly plain if you only knew what you are up against you would not complicate your affairs by well by taking on another risk bill had not the slightest idea what this dark-eyed girl was driving at he couldn't give anything away mr evans's plans the very nature of this mysterious business he had dropped into with the thunderstorm was still an unsolved enigma so far as he was concerned this girl no matter who she was appeared to be conversant with details of the situation if he continued to play mr johnson in whom she seemed vastly interested some real news might pop up unawares another risk he repeated taking up the threat of her last remark what if i say i don't mind taking risks mr johnson you talk lightly because you do not know it is one thing to keep out of the hands of the police but if you knew the truth about your new venture bill began to think that she was older than he first surmised her eyes were half closed and the curves of her mouth had moulded into a firm line it gave him quite a shock of surprise to see that look on her face a look of grim defiance the look of one who would not hesitate to shoot and shoot straight in an extremity 
you don't mind risks well mr johnson you'll have risks in plenty before you're much older bill smiled maybe but i'll never have a closer shave than i had this morning you must admit that if you and old jim hadn't been on this island i should have gone under for keeps don't speak of it any more said the girl her expression changed and a gentler note came into her voice try to get some sleep that's what you need more than anything else at present in a few hours i'll bring you something to eat and you'll feel better you're very kind and i'll never be able to thank you properly but really if you could see your way to help me get back to the mainland quickly i'd be more than obliged she shook her head i won't hear of it you're not fit for any such thing i insist on your having some sleep first perhaps you don't realize it but you are still looking dreadfully white and shaky bill saw that there was nothing to do but comply with her orders so he lay down again on the cot that's better she said now i must go i'll be back later on and hope you'll be comfortable in the meantime with that she went out and shut the door bill heard a click she had turned the key in the lock he started up at the sound but dropped back a faint smile on his lips if she wanted to be sure that he kept to the hut well that was her business he was to all purposes a prisoner anyway lock or no lock unless he could get hold of a boat there would be no leaving the island swimming was out of the question one try at the currents surrounding this rocky shore was quite enough but who were this girl and the old man she said she lived here but that could mean anything had charlie been able to get back to the house the youngster evidently hated the spooky place would he stay there now that he was alone with these thoughts buzzing through his tired brain bill fell into sleep he awoke to find the girl at his side bearing a tray filled with food what hour it was he could not tell and at the moment he did not inquire his main obsessions now were a racking thirst and an ardent hunger for food he'd had nothing to eat since early morning and the chops fried potatoes and tea with brown bread and honey tasted delicious while he did justice to the fare the girl sat on a packing case in the doorway chatting inconsequentially when the last morsel of his meal had disappeared bill thanked her again then he rose to his feet determined to bring matters to a head i hope it won't put you to any inconvenience he said quietly but i will take it as a favor if you'll help me get back to the mainland now please don't think i haven't appreciated your hospitality you have been more than kind to me but you understand it is vitally important for me to get back ah your walking tour is so important as all that she cast an amused glance up at him certainly bill met her look firmly if you'll be good enough to give orders for the boat i'm afraid mr johnson she said slowly that that is impossible impossible you mean there's no way of getting across i thought you said something about a motorboat has anything gone wrong with it i don't mean that mr johnson i mean that you must remain here to be frank i have my instructions instructions and from whom he demanded curtly the girl looked at him steadily you must not ask it is too late now for you to back out you should have thought of the risks you ran before you came up here on this errand i have no wish to back out of anything he exclaimed shortly and as for risks i told you before that i am willing to take them but my mind is made up on one thing i'm going back to the mainland now he made as if to pass her in the doorway she stepped aside her eyes fixed smilingly on his you may go she said i wish you a pleasant swim but the motorboat bill cried exasperated i intend to use that motorboat though i have to run her myself the girl laughed <laughs> you will have your work cut out mr johnson the motorboat has gone bill stared at her then abruptly he turned and walked out of the hut and up a steep incline that led to the cliffs overlooking the sea twenty-five feet below 
deep water swirled about its base where year in and year out the strong current had eaten into solid rock he heard a footstep beside him of course said the girl her eyes twinkling there's a dinghy locked in the boat-house but you can't break the lock because i tried one day when i thought i'd lost the key i'm sorry mr johnson but i'm afraid you'll have to put up with my company for a little while longer bill did not reply he was listening to the unmistakable sound of a four-cylinder engine one of whose cylinders intermittently missed fire a motor-boat shot round the point to the left and swung in toward the base of the cliff it carried a single occupant here she comes now he said that's not our boat whose is it then i don't know but i can guess that you bill shouted the man in the motor-boat bill to his certain knowledge had never laid eyes on him before it sure is he shouted back will you take me across the man seemed to hesitate then he slowed down his small craft you'll have to jump bill was what he said using his hands as a megaphone but i say jump you fool and be quick about it there was authority as well as power in the strident tones bill kicked off the leather moccasins he wore and stepped back a few paces you're not harold johnson exclaimed the girl never said i was returned bill sorry to leave so hastily but there's a reason thanks for everything bye-bye what a perfect idiot i've been she cried you're bill bolton of course of course grinned bill and sprang toward the edge don't go she shrieked it's sanders he'll kill you don't she screamed bill's body shot through the air and he cut the water below in a very pretty dive End of chapter seven chapter eight of bill bolton and hidden danger by noel sainsbury this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. chapter eight the man with the nervous affliction bill came to the surface a few yards from the motor-boat three or four quick strokes brought him to the side where with the help of an extended hand he clambered aboard to face the stranger getting back his wind bill took stock of the man his first impression had been of his slight build but on closer scrutiny bill saw that he was well knit with very broad shoulders he had a rather sallow clean-shaven face with unexpectedly large and very bright dark eyes these eyes never left bill for a second as he opened the throttle and sent the boat skimming round the end of the island that was a very nice dive the man spoke abruptly with a quick nod as if to emphasize the point fond of swimming aren't you though not as keen on it as you were this morning eh he grinned at what he considered a good joke and nodded his head emphatically bill began to realize that this continual nodding must be a form of nervousness and that probably the man himself was unconscious of it thanks for the lift mr um, sanders he said that's right sanders is the name the man at the wheel jerked out the young lady recognized me it seems needn't have been so dramatic about it though i kind of guessed you'd have enough of pig island by this time what made you think so well mr sanders nodded there's no reason to keep the thing a secret i moseyed over to the island a few hours ago tied up down to other end from the houses happened to overhear deborah talking to old jim caught on to the fact that they'd taken you for slim johnson and that they meant to keep you with them a while and they didn't know you were spying the more bill saw of his smiling nodding rescuer the less he liked him oh it ain't likely i'd let him catch sight of me i don't know about the girl but old jim hancock is one of those fellers who never misses with a rifle so you i take it mr sanders are working for the other side in this mysterious business i am the other side mr midshipman bolton what made you think i'd want to chum up with evans secretary evans secretary bill repeated in amazement you mean that girl deborah is his secretary 
surest thing you know young man evans owns pig island didn't he tell you that mr sanders laughed sardonically and nodded until bill thought he would burst a blood vessel he hoped he would and so said bill light dawning at last you decided it would be swell to have me throw myself into your arms as it were and before those people on the island and i woke up to the fact that we were on the same side of the fence in this mix-up mentally he cursed himself for his impulsiveness who'd have thought you'd tumble so fast sneered sanders then as bill made a threatening move toward him an automatic whipped into sight from beneath sanders armpit oh no you don't sonny he barked it won't pay you to get nasty with me sit down it's time you learned a few things you young whelp there's no doubt about that bill agreed bitterly looking into the blue black muzzle some four feet away he bent backward as though to sit down on the thwart when without warning his right leg shot out and he planted a smashing blow with his bare foot upon the underside of sanders wrist the automatic flew harmlessly overside while the astounded man found himself seized by his tingling wrist his arm was jerked forward with a suddenness that almost wrenched it from the socket while bill's other arm wrapped tightly about the semi-paralyzed member there came another wrench and dizzying pain and he went head first out of the boat after his revolver when he rose to the surface his craft was already some yards away as i said before bill called to him there's no doubt about it you should learn savat the french method of foot boxing you know that arm hold i learned among others from a jiu-jitsu professor a jap it pays to have international tastes incidentally i don't think the current is bad about here you're only about sixty yards from shore cheerio as they say in merry england a pleasant swim mr sanders sanders said nothing he felt too sick even to swear his right arm pained him so that he turned on his back and headed for shore using his left and both legs as a means to propel his aching body bill widened his throttle and sped up the motorboat keeping the shore line on his left a mile farther on he came to the mouth of the cove where he had bathed with charlie that morning he shut off the engine and took a survey of his surroundings the gentle breeze had gone with the morning not a branch moved not a leaf stirred on the trees above the rocks bill guessed it must be close to seven in the evening for the sun was barely discernible above the woods and long shadows lay upon the quiet water next he made a thorough inspection of the boat which brought to light two interesting items in a locker forward he came upon the clothes he had left on the beach that morning bill was delighted for this find provided him with two things he needed badly shoes and a watch beneath the clothes was a light overcoat of covert cloth apparently the property of sanders he pulled it out and was about to put it back again when a thought struck him a closer inspection of the coat brought forth first a pair of pigskin gloves then from the inside pocket bill extracted three envelopes all three of these missives bore the stamford connecticut postmark and all three were addressed to zenas sanders general delivery clayton maine without the slightest hesitation bill took the papers from the slick envelopes two proved to be bills one for repairs on a car the other from a tailor for three suits of clothes the third letter however was headed green's hotel stamford connecticut and bore the date of three days earlier it ran dear sanders just a line to say i have engaged the experts as directed got them in the big city and they sure do ask a big price but that is your business now you have located the exact position it either means taking the evans bunch for a ride or making a snappy job of it personally i don't think it can be done in one night don't write any more both mails and telegraph are too risky that gink evans is wide awake he's watching this end too and you know he's intercepted two messages already 
i know what to do but if you must send your fool instructions send them by word of mouth or better still fly down here and go up with us then we could run in nights and stand out to sea daytimes and you would be on board to direct operations that would stop evans having you followed up there when you join us as you must eventually also if we don't write any more there will be no chance of his being able to get documentary evidence if you send a man let him say zenas and not like you then i'll know he's okay yours slim bill read this over three times the writer he guessed must be harold johnson the fellow he had been taken for on the island he recalled distinctly that sanders had referred to him as slim who or what the experts were he had hired was beyond bill on the other hand it was obvious that slim feared mr evans the scheme as he saw it was that johnson and his men intended coming by boat to maine where sanders had been successful in locating something they wanted and having arrived in maine waters the boat would put her crew of gangsters ashore at night and stand off the coast daytimes that robbery of some sort was their objective bill had not the slightest doubt but what they intended to steal or where it was located slim had not said perhaps it was something concealed at turner's hidden in a safe possibly and the experts had been hired to get it still if mr evans was hiding something in a safe at turner's what prevented him from moving it to the strong room of some metropolitan bank where it would be beyond reach of both sanders and johnson bill discarded the idea of the safe then and there the best he could do was to get in touch with mr evans or his men just as soon as possible he slipped the letter back into the overcoat pocket and folding the coat replaced it in the locker he did not want sanders to guess that he had read that letter then he thought over a plan of procedure if he took the motorboat to pig island he must take the coat with him and sanders suspicions would be aroused if on the other hand he beached the craft and made for turner's sanders who was very likely now footing it for the cove might think that in his hurry bill had overlooked slim's letter also he would be more likely to find mr evans at turner's and then there was charlie to be considered if the boy had reached the house and his father had not turned up he would be forced to stay in that gloomy place himself overnight a prospect that not even bill relished as he reached these conclusions bill sent the motorboat skimming into the cove and beached her then slipping into his socks and shoes he picked up the remainder of his clothes it took him but a moment to cross the sand and climb the rocks soon he was jogging along the lane at a smart trot he neither met nor saw a single soul at last he gained the back door by way of the overgrown shrubbery he found the key under the mat where they had left it after breakfast bill inserted it in the lock and walked into the back entry instead of calling charlie he walked into the big kitchen and looked about everything seemed exactly as they had left it after washing up that morning well it's a cinch the kid never got back here he said to himself he'd have spent most of the day in here consuming provisions and there's not a thing been touched i'd better make sure though and if i can scare up a gun of sorts all to the good his inspection of the entire house including the cellar proved his surmise to be well founded he was alone in the place charlie he figured had either trudged into clayton to get in touch with ezra parker or he had been captured by sanders and his men and then it occurred to bill that it would be well for him to see parker himself to-night so he went down the tunnel to the garage and switched on the lights it was dark by the time he got back to the library he went the rounds of the ground floor again turning on electrics as he went if bill was to be caught by anybody around the spooky house it would not be unawares if he could help it he got himself some supper and ate it in the kitchen but somehow after going to the trouble of preparing food he had little appetite the possibility that the house might have another hidden entrance of which he knew nothing made him feel nervous and jumpy especially since he had not found anything remotely resembling a firearm of any sort after he had washed his plate and cup at the kitchen sink 
he went back to the library and pulling down a book at random from the shelves went out of the room to the hall he had decided to wait until eleven and then make tracks through the woods to twin heads harbor ezra parker was due to fly over the house at midnight and the lighted garage would be sure to send him to the harbor directly afterward bill planned to spend the intervening time in the comfortable alcove which formed a little lounge below the staircase in the hall here he could at once be aware of the slightest movement from any part of the house and with the curtains drawn he was shut off like a monk in his cell but instead of settling down to his book he grew restless twice he got up and examined the shutters on that floor to make sure they were barred each time he went back to his curtained retreat ashamed of himself this house was giving him the creeps for some reason he could not tell why his nerves were on edge as ten o'clock chimed faintly from the mantel timepiece he thought he heard footsteps he started up reviling himself for his folly the house was old and it was only the stairs above him that creaked softly with calm deliberation he brushed past the curtain into the hall determined to pull himself together standing at the foot of the staircase a hand on the great oak balustrade he could hear the quiet patter of a mouse behind the panelling the tick of the little clock in the alcove and the hiss and sigh of the wind without were all that broke the silence of the night no human being save himself seemed to be stirring for miles around slowly in stocking feet he walked down the kitchen passage paused and slowly returned then he mounted the stairs all was quiet above an impulse took him up the narrow stairway to the third story where he looked out a window at the end of the corridor the night was dark and only a grayish glimmer marked the sea the island was invisible up there with the still house below him he felt like an onlooker in some mysterious play where life and death were casual matters and any means were fair if they led to triumph but there was nothing to be gained by pursuing such thoughts and far from being an onlooker bill was very much in the thick of it all he descended made another tour of the ground floor and returned to the alcove feeling distinctly more cheerful he ate a couple of cookies took up his book and began to read perhaps five minutes later he heard a gentle tap it was not imagination this time of that he was quite certain bill was perfectly calm he had got over his bout of restlessness that had kept him on the jump the only disturbing point about the sound was whether it came from within or without the house a leaf blowing against a window that might have caused it the creak of an old beam would have made the same sound he waited in silence and kept a tight grip on himself no more strung-up nerves whether this was a false alarm or not perhaps a minute later he heard the click again with an exclamation of annoyance bill got to his feet brushed aside the curtain and peered into the hall he found himself face to face with mr zenas sanders End of chapter 8